Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Snark Squad Pod. We're still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Sweeney. And I am Marinez. Mari, what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about the book Bone Gap by Laura Ruby. So Mari, this was your pick. So I guess first of all, what what is Bone Gap? Um, Bone Gap is a young adult book that I would say it's hard to classify, I think, genre-wise, but I think it's something of a mix between a contemporary and a fantasy. And it tells the story of a young boy in a small town that is loosely based on the myth of Hades and Persephone. So why did you pick this for the podcast? I I had heard about this book through through booktube i have a friend who really really enjoyed the book and two years ago we went to an event together we went to book expo america and laura ruby was there at the event so my friend got to meet laura ruby and she was kind of gushing about this book and she got to ask laura ruby some questions about who her characters represented mythology wise and so they were having this whole conversation about like who was zeus and who was uh, demeter and and like I just remember being intrigued. Like I had no idea what was going on. So I was like, wait a second. Like, I want to know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> um, but it wasn't until this year. So it took me a while to kind of get her, get around to reading it. So I read it this year and I, I thought that it would be a good discussion piece because some of the themes that she brings up through the book, like regardless of whether you're kind of, like the book or don't like the book, I think in general, there are some themes that she brings up that are worthy of discussing. I would agree with that. I think that the like thematic efforts of the book are where it really excels, which I think is it, like is an interesting thing. And I, I think ha- could make this book somewhat divisive because I think that there are some some con- like its weaknesses are in in construction like there are some some places where it's just where the way that it is assembled is a little bit sort of weird and and unwieldy so it's interesting that you talk about the book being kind of divisive because in my small sampling of just like friends I know who have read this um that's very much true I just I know people who have loved it and I know people who have hated it if you look at Goodreads which is you know not always a a very good source but just kind of getting an idea of like what people rate it it's like a three point eight I think on on Goodreads so it's like people are very middling about it but it was uh, nominated for the National Book Award. It won the Prince Award, and I, it, it's garnered some awards and some nominations and some good reviews and, and starred reviews and such. So I think there there is definitely that gap between what it did or what it set out to do and what it is thematically versus how people experience it. And just like, you know, especially a casual reader, how they would experience this book, there's probably a difference there. What what are what were like the key, your favorite, I guess, elements of that? I don't know. I guess I'm going to answer this partially with a question for you too. (laughs) So um, I don't know how, this is kind of a silly question because I think it is a very well-known thing, but how familiar you are with the myth of Hades and Persephone? Relatively familiar. Okay. I think that same, like I think Hades and Persephone is like a myth that when you're learning about Greek mythology is one that is like taught to us. Like, you know, especially because it is very allegorical for the seasons changing and all of that, all of that stuff. So what I didn't know was, well, what I kind of became exposed to, again, through being the bookish community, is that there are people who are really into the Hades and Persephone myth and don't necessarily view Hades as the villain in that story. Yes. Or that they they really buy into the idea that Persephone re- later falls in love with Hades. So that there are retellings and stuff that really focus on the romantic aspect of that story, if you can kind of find it there. Uh, so which is something I had never thought of, something I, I don't think that I necessarily agree with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that should be a surprise to no one that I'm like, ew, don't like it. Yeah. 
But so kind of keeping that in mind, I think what my favorite theme of this book uh, was really this discussion of beauty and the perception of beauty in society and how we have uh, two main female characters and one is traditionally beautiful and one is repeatedly, we are repeatedly told is very homely and very not beautiful, peaty. So there are different experiences, the way that they're treated differently and just this entire idea that regardless of how you view the Hades-like character or Hades in the original myth, that he quote unquote fell in love with Persephone at quote unquote, you know, like kind of like first sight. And so that idea of like, when you are traditionally beautiful, like what society thinks you owe them. Right. Uh, you know, so like Hades kind of like carried her off just because he saw her and thought she was beautiful. So regardless of like what happens later on in the myth, that idea of like what you owe people if they think you're beautiful. The book is rather explicit about this idea of like looking versus seeing like that's that's that is the sort of the specific phrasing that the characters use kind of over and over again. The way that Rosa and Petey move through the world, the way that other people receive them is based on this sort of very surface level looking without really like seeing or understanding much of anything about who they actually are as people. The way that that shapes both of their expectations, I, I think, is just is interesting and heartbreaking uh, to, to witness. I think also that we see um, kind of said we're like jumping into the deep end here, but yeah, yeah. I think all <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> I think also it's super interesting. So in the story, Rosa is um, she's kidnapped, obviously, away by by this this man and but she we also have flashbacks to kind of her past and we see that she's been on the receiving end of um unwanted you know sexual attention or advances um but rosa or i'm sorry pd has aspects of that in her story as well so pd was on the receiving end of a, a sexual advance that she turns down and because of that, like things happen to them both. And for Rosa, it's because she's beautiful. And for Petey, it's because she's not. So Petey then becomes like she gets surrounded by these rumors that she's, um, you know, promiscuous. And people then later think that when Finn is, you know, uh, falling in love with her, that P Finn is using her. So it's like just seeing the no win situation and kind of putting that on women in society and how there is a no win situation whether you're beautiful or not beautiful if you say no <laughs> if you have any kind of agency or if you you know deny consent that's held against you equally as much regardless of any perceived beauty yes yeah for rosa it rosa's deny you know denial of consent is is seen as in sort of the flashbacks uh that she views herself as better than other people and and for pd it's impossible basically <laughs> is essentially her her denied consent is, is seen as uh, yeah as as impossible that like she cannot possibly be serious by virtue of not being beautiful and i think so at the end of the day what you get is these two like portraits of women who are maybe um the victims of society and regardless of being beautiful or not beautiful they're victims of a society that places emphasis on beauty so you know that that kind of uh, applies to them both uh, regardless of one being more traditionally beautiful or not so i think that was probably my the the part of it that most resonated with me i think it made the both characters Rosa and uh, Petey really relatable and really complex to me. So that was definitely my favorite. Uh, yes, I, I would agree. I have kind of mixed feelings about the way in which Rosa was presented. What I enjoyed is basically everything we've just discussed is is how how she sort of fit into this larger, larger theme of looking versus seeing. I struggled a little bit because it felt frequently the the telling of Rosa, the characterization of Rosa straddled this line that you see a lot of these sort of like, she's just so impossibly beautiful. I feel like there were several moments where we weren't quite getting much more than that, um, where it, it was sort of 
dwelling on that and not giving us quite enough of who she actually is as a person. And I also just the flashback stuff it was over the top in this way that was frustrating because it took this like very otherwise very, I don't know, emotional and like moving and, and like poignant commentary. And, and it, it made it almost distancing, like rather than pulling me in and empathizing. I don't know. I, I, I struggled a little bit with Rosa at times because of this. And some of it was intentional. Some of it is sort of like, you know, the idea that the, the town just that she's this sort of mysterious figure and, and the town and Bone Gap, you know, only saw her as as the this beautiful girl who they loved basically for being beautiful. I think there were there were a few places throughout the book where I, I just wanted Rosa to be a little bit more fully realized than I think she was. Do you think that we get a little bit more of that from PD's? Yes. Story? Because we're with Finn, right? Like, based, you know, right. from the beginning. Um, and so like, we get more of PD as Finn gets to know PD, basically, which uh, that worked for me in a way that, like, I, I struggled more with Rosa. But I, I feel like I have a much better sense of who PD is than who Rosa is. I think um, PD's story, for the most part, is probably a little more grounded in the contemporary portion of the story. So PD get, got to have a little bit more normal conversations. And they yeah, have that, yeah. that kind of ongoing joke about, like, college essays and, you know, which I love. I love it. I so, did too. Such like a, just like a silly whatever. Uh, but I, yeah, I loved that gag. I did too. So she's, she's got like that whole portion of it. I feel like a lot of Rosa, I, I think the author tried to make sure that Rosa wasn't um, just kind of this object that's being acted upon. And we see that kind of towards the end when she, she is working her own way toward an escape from her kidnapper. So it isn't just about her being rescued, like she's actively trying to get out of that. But I think a lot of her portion of the story is in the, the myth-based portion. So it, it's a little less tangible. It's a little harder to kind of grasp onto who she is as a character. Yeah. I don't know that what the like the solution to that is, right? Like I don't know that it's clear to me how else like how else you could have done that. I, I do think that one thing that jumps out is that I, this book could have been a little bit longer. I think that maybe there are par parts of the book where you could have given a little bit more space to Rosa's story and that might have helped because uh, the book is not very long. I think that when one of my sort of central critiques is like there is a character who was not quite fully realized at the end and the book is in general, fairly concise, that it seems then like the somewhat natural solution is lend a little bit more space and time to that character. Yeah. And I'm kind of think, sitting here thinking like, again, like I, how would that have been accomplished? And I don't know that I have an answer because the the flashbacks weren't the thing. They they were not the no, thing. No. So <laughs> Yeah, again, the flashbacks are are probably the weakest part of the story for me. Uh, were there any things that any parts of it that you struggled with or was this just like a solid loved it all in experience for you? I I think that it it took me a little bit um of time to get into the story itself. I really at the end of the day appreciated Laura Ruby's writing. But I think that it's very almost rhythmic and she does this thing that she plays a lot with sentence structure. So she'll give you like these short, punchy sentences, but then give you like a run on that just goes on and on with these descriptions. And it's like super it's very lyrical, but it's also a book that I felt like needed all of my attention and I couldn't be like half reading it and so it took me a while to kind of really sink into the story so yeah I feel it's funny that you said that it was like a short book and I was like wait how like how long was this book <laughs> because I didn't necessarily like really think of it as a short book huh. but probably because of that it took me a while to get into it and it is so I looked it up it's 373 pages which oh, is huh yeah, it's longer it's, than I thought. Yeah, it's well that that at least that's what's pulling up uh, on Goodreads. So, it's it's like a medium sized yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> that, I stand I stand corrected. Yeah, it yeah. felt short to me. Uh, it felt long to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting.
interesting. Well, maybe most of what I just said is now irrelevant, but I won't cut it out. (laughs) I said it. No, but the point remains that, you know, at the end of the the book, Rosa probably wasn't as fully realized as she could have been. Yeah. So. Yeah, I don't know. That is really interesting, though. That's I don't know. I think, yeah, that I, I, I just it felt it felt short to me. I don't know why uh, I, I did. I also did love the writing, though. Yeah, just the the very lyrical nature of the writing was wonderful thoroughly enjoyed that it could have the story could have been like garbage but i uh just like, yeah. beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. It, in that way it's a little bit like uh like the writing it, it's not the same thing but my feeling about her writing is somewhat similar to my feeling about the night circus in the night like i enjoyed the circus so much that like kind of everything else is whatever uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay people are doing things but look <laughs> how pretty yeah <laughs> so I'm curious because I think one of the other things that I really liked about the story was its commentary on small towns and you know it's set in a small town it's got all of these cornfields that kind of play a big role like a big part in the story but not in any overt way like you never really know what the corn means it's just like hanging out in the background so I've never really lived in a small town but I was wondering if that if you had the same feeling about it like did it pick up that small time town vibe for you yeah for sure I yeah I I loved that element of it as well actually I kind of forgot um it's been, been a couple weeks since I read it but I yeah, thoroughly enjoyed the the small town vibe. I loved the ambiguous nature of the corn in the story and just the way that it kept sort of popping up throughout was really cool. I found these the these two teenagers sort of navigating their like small town existence and the, their futures beyond it just very very relatable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was really cool that that the atmosphere of this small town felt very real. And I felt like I could picture this place very clearly in my mind. I think um, at the end of the day, the corn just, and I I really think Laura Ruby just thinks cornfields are creepy. Like, (laughs) I think that's really the long and short of it. And she even says like a couple of times, like that's why corn is in scary movies. Like cornfields are always in scary movies. I just really think she thinks they're creepy, which fair, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Last episode, we were talking about Riverdale and we're talking about it as, you know, being kind of a murder history, but really a coming of age story. And I feel that because I really enjoyed Finn and PD's story within here, for me, it was kind of that too. Like it's a coming of age story, but also like this other stuff about the mythology or whatever. But the heart of it is really a coming of age yes, story. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, Finn and, Finn and PD, their whole dynamic was uh, the best. I loved watching their friendship and, and they were definitely the heart of it. Also, the thing about cornfields and all the scary movies is that no one's there is that they're like isolating and like American scary movies are about like being out in the wilderness alone. Uh, and that's what we're afraid of. It's not the cornfields, Laura Ruby. It's not the cornfields themselves. <laughs> it's the absence of other human life that is terrifying. Just so that's, we're clear. <laughs> that's interesting in like in context of the story, you know, just kind of putting that in the context of small towns too. And the idea of, being by yourself or being isolated is scary but also like being in the small town where you're never really alone and everyone knows what you're doing and just also you know so we come to find that Rosa is kidnapped and she's almost in like this other dimension so it's never really said like it's an underworld or anything like that it's just kind of like another dimension and bone gap is full of all of these gaps that you can fall through so the cornfield is kind of like the line of like demarcation between like the small town and like the the other dimension and having that like creepy factor in between so that makes sense yes so yeah so how did you feel about the the lines between the the sort of realistic stuff and the magical elements of it I, it was strange and I think that I would not fault people and I don't fault people who don't necessarily like this book because there are portions of it that obviously have very deep meaning and that you can you know talk about and and 
think about all the ways, all the things that it could mean. But there's a lot of it that is just strange for the sake of being strange. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like the corn felt that way. And there were other elements like that just felt like, okay, this is just weird. They they take like a, uh, they take a a nighttime, like um, the horse, the horse. Yeah. Yeah. And then they just like fall for a really long time. Uh And it's like, okay, like, I'm not sure. And they like, she's like sort of describes it. And then, but like, mostly it's just, yeah, we like saw some shit, man. So now we're really close (laughs) because you you gotta be close with the person who, who experienced that with you. But, uh, what, what did you experience? I'm not clear. I I don't know either. And so there was like a portion of that that was definitely like, okay, okay, Laura Ruby. (laughs) If you're just going to go with it, then I guess I'll just have to go with it. (laughs) What did you think? Did you enjoy those pieces or was it kind of off-putting to you? It it was a mix. Some of it I loved, like the corn. (laughs) The corn. corn. (laughs) I'm uh, yeah, pro corn. Uh, other, Other pieces of it I wasn't so sure about. I was a little personally put off by how long it took to be clear about the fact that that's what was happening. I I knew nothing about this book before starting it, and I wasn't really clear on like when we were, uh, where those lines were. And so there were parts early on where I was just like, I don't know what's happening now. And in a way that doesn't feel that makes this unpleasant for me but for the most part for the most part I was really into the the quirkiness of of that I just I think my only thing would have been kind of setting that stage just a little bit earlier would have completed it for me it was just that like initially kind of settling into oh okay this is what's happening this is what we're doing here in this book that was like a little a little bit of a, a hump to get over but other than that I was a big fan. The The book is often categorized as like fabulism or magical realism. I called it fantasy because I feel like it almost goes above and beyond magical realism because it has a, a, those elements that aren't really based in realism. Yes. <laughs> they're just really fucking weird. <laughs> That's what they are. <laughs> yes. The, their nighttime rides on the horse are not magical realism. That's, no. <laughs> that is not. I, that, uh, no. Sorry. There's no realism there. Straight fantasy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is that is straight fantasy. I understand that they are a small portion of the total book, uh, so I, I, like I get that classification. But uh, no, no, nah, no, <laughs> there's there's no realism there. That's a no. The end of the book is uh, the like the big final scene is all of everyone who's ever died spinning around upside down <laughs> so just so we're clear is it weird that I kind of forgot about that <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, because I was like, yeah, Nicole, you should read this, definitely. <laughs> Just wait till you get, wait till you get to the, the merry-go-round of the dead. Uh, That'll be great. There were a couple other places besides sort of that initial, what is this, I guess, where I was a little bit like, I I don't know. But yeah, in general, I loved it. I really I really just loved the corn, though. <laughs> the more we talk about it. <laughs> it has so much meaning, though. I yeah. know I said it was meaningless before, but. <laughs> it's just okay. so goofy and weird. <laughs> I have a question. Were you able to pinpoint besides Hades and Persephone any of the other characters no. as their no their counterparts? No, I I was actually going to ask you about that. So wh- who else? Like what else did Laura Ruby have to say about this? Because I, I had a really hard time with that. Okay, so I initially thought that when I ended the book, I had a question if Finn was the Demeter stand-in just because of the horse. Demeter, Demeter, I think either. She she sometimes manifested as a black horse. So that was a thing about her. So he was riding around in, on the horse. So I was like, well, is he is he the one? Because he's really the one grieving Rosa 
miss being missing. And so I thought that that was a thing, but that was wrong. <laughs> I feel like in that sense, it makes more sense that the horse itself is because the horse is like guide in, in a way, the horse guides Finn back. Right. So then like Demeter is basically appearing to help her daughter be rescued. Yeah. So the Demeter character, according to uh, what Laura Ruby said was Babsha, her grandma. Sure, that makes sense. Which is like obvious, but also she's so removed from the story that I'm just like, ah, uh, boo. <laughs> okay, wait, but is is the horse also? <laughs> is, is, that, is, is that her uh, uh-huh. <laughs> coming, coming to finish? It's gotta be. It's yeah. the only explanation. <laughs> okay, good, great. I'm glad we're agreed. Go on. So maybe when they're like falling a really long time, they're just going to Poland. Oh, uh-huh. okay, good. <laughs> I like that you received that as an actual like valid explanation. Yep, <laughs> yep it's decided. They went to Poland. Excellent. Boom. And that's why they <laughs> fell in love. Annotate the book. Uh, <laughs> aha, and here they went to Poland again. Uh-huh. The only other confirmed uh character that I know is Charlie Valentine is Zeus. Huh. So Charlie Valentine is the old man who saw the kidnapping happen, but doesn't really do anything about it, which Zeus in the myth sees Persephone get kidnapped, but he doesn't do anything about it. And um, he's surrounded by chickens in his house. So he's surrounded by chicks. Um, you know, okay. <laughs> I don't like that. Uh-huh. So he, he talks about like his, all his dates. He doesn't like his children very much. And he's kind of, he was in bone gap before bone gap was bone gap. So he's kind of like the founder of this place. Sure. So sure. He is the Zeus character. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I don't like that. Don't Sometimes like that not all. knowing is yeah. like better than knowing. No. Yeah. <laughs> no? I'm not into no. that. Not into not, it at all. Not a fan. <laughs> oh, okay. you, I, it, it really lost me at he's surrounded by chicks. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> What? Oh, I'm just telling you <laughs> information that I've received. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to pretend that mm-hmm. we didn't have this conversation. Great. And continue my higher levels of enjoyment of the book. Because <laughs> <laughs> that information was a little disappointing. Okay, great. Snark Squad Pod, where we talk about stuff and <laughs> hate it even more <laughs> after we talk about it. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it it's, it's, wouldn't be the first time. Yeah, no, uh, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Here was this thing that I had fun with, and then we talked about it, and I realized it was the worst. <laughs> like changing my star rating as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Five stars? That seems a little high. That's absurd. <laughs> <laughs> I did I didn't mind Charlie Valentine as Zeus. I think mm-hmm. that yeah, Zeus is kind of a dick character anyways, so I mean, yes, I agree. But it was they imply that he is uh what's his name, who like you know, makes a deal with Hades to get his his lover out of the underworld as long as he doesn't look back, but then he does. Oh what who Orpheus and Eurydice. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, I forget at what point, but there's some point in the story where it is implied that he that that's who he is. And so I don't know. That is better. <laughs> I like that better. <laughs> that's probably also true because I've also like read interviews with Laura Ruby and she talks about pulling different pieces of mythology into this. And I think uh, I remember reading that she said that Petey and Finn were slightly based on Cupid and uh, Psyche. Huh. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. And so if you were, which I'm not familiar with that myth at all. So, but she says, if you know that myth, then their storyline kind of follows along with that as well. So maybe okay. it's both true. Maybe they're both true. Hmm. All right. All Michael's right. like, still don't like it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think, I think that, I think that that stuff is interesting and fun little bits of trivia but like there's a level of bending that that makes that sort of 
cool that you had that as this loose inspiration to draw on while writing what is otherwise like a fairly, you know, original and unique story. But I, I think it actually it, it takes away more than it adds to suggest that there are that those parallels exist uh, for me, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I'm the opposite. As soon as, <laughs> as soon as I finished, I was like Googling, like, who is this person and who is this character? Because <laughs> I feel like it adds to the experience and, and kind of adds to because the book sometimes makes no damn sense like there is a portion of it where I wanted to see like okay where is she pulling from like is there deeper meaning here which sometimes there was and sometimes there wasn't and yeah so I I think it added to me and I think that's an extension of a conversation about retellings and adaptations and you know how much the original material adds to your enjoyment or your experience of the retelling or the adaptation. Yeah, in this case, so like my my thing with that, it doesn't mean anything to me to suggest that Charlie Valentine is Zeus. Like, what is that? Like, what's, I don't know, uh, to me, like, that's not contributing anything here. Yeah. Except yeah. this, I don't know, that you can make a weird caricature argument about connecting them, like the thread that makes them similar. And I, I, I think Charlie Valentine was actually, you know, kind of an interesting side character. You know, he has, he has an interesting, you know, also not like super fleshed out because he's a peripheral character, but an interesting story and an, and an interesting character. The idea that he is supposed to be Zeus feels like hokey and silly to me. Okay. Okay. In a book that, as we have pointed out, frequently just doesn't make any sense. I don't know why that is like a line. <laughs> oh, for you're me. like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Corn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> too Good. much. Charlie Valentine has Zeus. <laughs> Too far, too far. Uh, but you know, that's fair. <laughs> that's my line. I don't know why. I, that just that is what it is. Well, I'm almost kind of sorry that I told you now. <laughs> like I, I wrote it down. Like just wait, wait till. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know because that was the piece of information that my friend and Laura Ruby were discussing at this event. Mm. So I kind of like that was kind of what I heard, and I was like, "Oh, what is this thing they're talking about?" Uh -huh, so, uh -huh. I, you know, I had a different introduction to the story than sure. most people do. Who sure. most people will probably have your experience where they go in and like not know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Where I was like going in like, "Okay, Charlie Valentine is Zeus." <laughs> 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 when he one. first appears, yeah. <laughs> hey. yeah. What up? <laughs> Anything else you got? We have we have not really talked about Finn at all. No, we have not, and he's the main he's character. The main character. <laughs> so before we end this, we should probably. You know, acknowledge the main character of this book. I think I just loved Petey the most. And so I did too. <laughs> yeah. I loved Petey so much. I did too. But Finn was very cool as like a, as a character, like the way that he was told was very, very interesting. The way that we got to his face blindness was also very interesting. I felt I felt for Finn. I did too. Pretty much immediately. Like his like his his sort of opening. So the 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 squishy lines between what is real and and not that stuff was was like a hump that I had to get over but I felt for Finn like pretty much immediately like his first little opening chapter I was like yep I'm I'm here for this character go on tell me more I think the first thing that we're told about him is that everybody in town calls him like moon face and spaceman or like they call him you or dude but they do so fondly so you know it's Immediately, my heart was like, oh, but really, do they? <laughs> like, <laughs> are they doing it fondly? I know. <laughs> like, I... poor you, poor kid. <laughs> poor baby. Yeah. So yeah. I definitely immediately felt for him. And I think that the reason that his face blindness, which, you know, becomes this kind of almost twist at the end of the story, he he sees Rosa getting kidnapped. Um, but nobody really believes that he saw the person or that Rosa was kidnapped because he can't 
describe the man who took Rosa. He can only explain the way that he moves. And I think that the reason that worked is because this is such a strange book that you're like, oh, that's just another like strange thing. Like he he can't. But there's so many clues going throughout, even the way he describes people, even in the first scene that he meets the rude boys or they're like five brothers and he doesn't know which one is which. He's always calling them each other's names. And they're like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm not that one of them. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And so yeah. you start, making, you know, and then it gets to the point where it's like, oh, he's face blind. He can't recognize and recognize faces. And you're like, oh, my gosh, like this one thing that I thought was just more just, strangeness is actually a thing uh-huh i enjoyed like playing that that element of of playing with the fact that uh you're never quite sure how much of this is rooted in 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 reality and and that they then that she sort of lets you believe throughout that this is this is also just part of the another fantastical element of the story a good little story a story moment I think so. I think one of the reasons i immediately was like on tim team finn as well is because adults not believing young people oh, yes. is like one of my like one of my I hate it <laughs> but it also like my heart goes out to those kids and young people like if adults don't believe what they're experiencing that's like immediately like oh my precious baby come here oh man and, yes. yeah yeah <laughs> so nobody believed him and it was just so frustrating so there's our there's our uh, tie-in because there's that's like a a pervasive problem across snark squad uh other yeah. things that we've yes. covered uh, <laughs> this is like the recurring snark lady lament is like adults listen to the fucking teenagers <laughs> listen to them uh, yeah there's just there's just too many examples buffy is first one that comes to mind i think more more most recently as soon as i said it like what popped into my head was a series of unfortunate events oh yeah which is just an entire experience of like adults not believing children not paying attention to them Uh uh-huh and so and the children's lives being worse for it over and over and over again right and even and even just to tie it even more even probably not a great tie but that's that story also has that feeling of like things are just strange because they are <laughs> like you're not entirely sure what's happening but things are just kind of weird so yeah which that's a good tie in also that story introduces that immediately uh so you know what you are in for which to be clear i am not saying is like necessarily the correct solution i i understand why somebody might not be bothered by like the fact that this book doesn't tell isn't uh, as upfront with uh it's like fantastical elements i just like for me for me personally i didn't i didn't dig it it didn't bother me so much because it was different and i feel like i read a lot and a lot of it starts to be the same so i got here and i was like Woo, what is this, <laughs> what? What, is this wow. <laughs> what is this corn you keep mentioning <laughs> <laughs> so you know it worked for me yeah 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 that's okay. fair well i think uh i think we just uh did another episode of a podcast we did it wow Yay. so if you want to talk to us about this episode or recommend some other things for us to watch or read or whatever uh you can find us at snarksquad.com where there will be a post specifically for this episode or you can tweet at us at snark underscore squad or i am at sweeney says and i am at my name is Marines. And we'll see you next week. Yeah.